Hi, my name is Amy Peck. Welcome to the show. We are in the Detroit Institute of Arts to view the highlights of the DIA's American Art Collection. It is located in the northwest wing of the DIA's second level. The galleries contain art objects from about the 1650s to 1900. The north wing contains the rest of the American collection. The DIA has one of the best compilations of American art in the country. Furniture, paintings, decorative art, and sculpture are placed together to show the visitors how people of means decorated their rooms from the colonial period to just before World War I. Our guide through the galleries is Dr. Ken Myers, curator and department head of American art before 1950. This is part two of the two-part series to showcase the DIA's American galleries from the 1800s to 1900. The first part covered the earliest colonial galleries starting about 1640 to the mid-1800s. The second part covers galleries with paintings, sculpture, and furniture all the way to 1900. A quick visit to the North Wing gives us a glimpse of famous paintings by James McNeil Whistler. The portraits of women are celebratory. They celebrate women as wives and as mothers. But if you think about it, women in these paintings are being pigeonholed. It suggests that their proper place is in the home as mothers or as wives, that they shouldn't look to have careers outside of the home. Something similar is going on in these paintings of Native Americans. On the one hand, the Native Americans are celebrated as noble figures. Their pose is based on Roman statuary. Like the woman in Burnt Out, these are heroic figures. But like the woman in Burnt Out, they're also shown as being limited. Noble, yes, but noble savages. The Indian Telegraph, the painting on the left, implies or makes explicit in its very title that the Indian Telegraph may seem heroic, but it's doomed to destruction because the real telegraph, the electronic telegraph, is going to sweep its way in the progress of history. Something similar is implied, I think, by the great Bierstadt painting of Wolf River, where we see an early moment in the history of interaction between Western fur trappers and native suppliers. Here, the men cross the river. It's Edenic. It's peaceful. But we know that the fur trappers are the first wave of an encroaching civilization, and that as farmers and cattlemen follow in their path, the Indians will not be able to continue to pursue their traditional way of life on the prairie. The painting, too, implies, without quite stating, that as noble as Native Americans seem, their way of life is doomed by the progress of Western American civilization. All the paintings in this gallery were done by African American artists. One reason, one important reason, why we wanted to bring works by African American artists together into a single gallery is that they worked in standard styles, like that of Anglo-American painters working in the same decades. So that if we hung these paintings in the regular galleries, one might not even notice that they were made by African-American artists. Everything on this wall was painted by an artist named Robert Scott Duncanson, who spent much of his career in Cincinnati and a good part of his career here in Detroit. One of his best-known paintings Uncle Tom and Little Eva was commissioned by a Detroit resident and shows a climactic scene from Harriet Beecher Stowe's anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, where the Edenic child, Little Eva, is talking with Tom about their shared faith in Christ and redemption. Duncanson often had to struggle to make a good living and painted works in a wide variety of different genres, including still lifes and portraits and religious paintings. But most of his most important paintings are landscapes, of which this is one of the greatest, showing Ellen's Isle, Loch Katrine in Scotland. 
like a painting by Thomas Cole, which probably lies behind this work, or Worthington Whitridge, who Duncanson knew when they were both living in Cincinnati. The painting is organized into clear foreground, middle bound, background with a tree marking the right closure, a diagonally organized view down the center pulling the eye from the foreground back to the setting sun in the background. Genre painting dominated discussion of American art through the 1840s and into the early 1850s. But by the mid-1850s, landscape had come to the center of artistic production. The first important American landscape painter was Thomas Cole. Cole, born in England, immigrated to the United States as a child, moved to New York in 1825 where he began to produce unprecedented scenes of American wilderness, like the DIA's great painting of Catterskill Falls. His early reputation was founded on these scenes of wilderness, but within a few years, he began to paint paintings like the one in the center of the wall of Europe, often with ruins. And this contrast between Europe, identified by ruins or old buildings with the past, and wild nature, which symbolized the opportunity, the openness, the newness of the new world. Catterskill Falls, was painted in 1826 when Cole was a very young man at the very beginning of his career. Almost 20 years later, he painted this view of a lake in New Hampshire, probably based on Lake Winnipesaukee, but Cole gave it a generic title, calling it American Lake Scene. It's a calm sunset, the figure, hard to see, seated on that little rocky outcropping, is a Native American docked his canoe watches the sunset lost in reverie at God's beneficence that shines on the world. In addition to these paintings, the DIA also has a wonderful collection of about 3,500 drawings by Thomas Cole, about 80% of the drawings he ever produced. They're one of the real treasures of the museum. We acquired them back in 1939 when there wasn't much interest in Hudson River drawings. We bought them directly from Cole's descendants. And we're so proud of them that we often have a small sampling of five or six of them on view in the galleries. One of the things that's wonderful about our collection of Cole drawings is that it lets us see Cole at work. The drawing we're looking at now was done on a trip to New Hampshire and is typical of the works that he did in the spring, summer, and fall when he was working outdoors visiting motifs that he would paint in his studio in the fall and winter. Here, when you get up close to it, you can see that he's not just outlining Mount Coraway in New Hampshire, but he's leaving himself color notations to say rocky stone, gray, or sky blue, or trees deep green. The drawing in the middle is very different. It was a drawing that he did in the studio when he was planning out the design of one of his imaginary paintings, a painting based on the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, as described by Milton in his great poem, Paradise Lost. One of the reasons that artists like Cole drew outside rather than painting was that if they wanted to paint outside, they had to prepare, mix their colors with oil, store them in pig bladders, which they tied off with rope, and take the prepared paints with them into the woods. But the paints dried out, the ties came off, and worst of all, the pig bladders were easily punctured. So both creating a mess and wasting often expensive colors. American painters didn't start to paint outside until the 1840s, after the invention of prepared oil paints in lead tubes. One of the first of the artists to work out side that way was Thomas Cole, and we're lucky enough to have one of very few outdoor plein air paintings that Thomas Cole painted, this little view of a rivulet in deep woods. Cole died about two years after this painting, was, this oil study was done, and oil studies never became central to his practice the way they did for other artists like Albert Bierstadt in the 1850s and 1860s. This wonderful painting of Vernal Falls in what is now Yosemite National Park was painted by Bierstadt on his first visit to the falls, painted on paper, a lightweight support, but then he had the paper mounted on canvas after he got back to New York. 
Drawings like this were sometimes sold, but were most often kept by the artist as aids to memory in the studio, and he would use them to create larger paintings, which he sold. In the mid-1840s, the two American landscape painters who seized on the availability of oil paints most aggressively were Asher B. Durand, we see his Monument Mountain on my left, and then further on my left, John Frederick Kensett. Beginning about 1845, Kensett and Durand spent months every summer and fall working outdoors, working on small 18 by 22 oil studies that they would work on for days or even weeks at a time, focusing on the details of forest interiors, of mossy rocks, of moss-grown trees. Then, back in the studio in the winter and spring, they would turn their oil studies into large finished paintings like these. Monument Mountain is based on, takes its title from a poem by William Cullen Bryant. We see the mountain in the background filled with this rushing water of a Berkshire stream and a clear passageway on the right indicating a trail. No people have pressed into this wilderness. Duran values it as an untrammeled nature, beautiful in itself. Kensett and Durand were influenced by Cole, knew Cole well, often worked with him. In fact, Durand, who was a little older than Cole, was one of Cole's closest friends until Cole's death. Unlike Durand and Kensett, Frederick Church, whose painting code epoxy we're looking at now, was a full generation younger than Cole. Not so much a friend as a student. Born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut, Church decided as a young man that he wanted to become a landscape painter, and his well-to-do father arranged for Church to study with Cole in Cole's home in Catskill, New York from 1844 to 1846. By the early 1860s, when this painting was painted, Church was the most successful, best paid, most famous artist active in the United States. In the 1850s, in search of new wild scenery, he went to South America, to the Andes, to see the great volcanoes, including this painting in Ecuador, what was then Ecuador, known as Cotopaxi, which he thought was the highest peak in the Andes, and which he also believed to be the most perfectly shaped volcano in the world. Church painted Cotopaxi on a number of occasions, this being the climactic painting of the series. In this painting, Church is eager to explore the cycles of nature, the cycles of geology, of new material coming up from the interior of the earth as ash, and then water eroding the cliffs and forming the rocks that fill the chasm. Like other contemporaries, Church was an eager reader of the discoveries of geological science that in the late 18th and early 19th century had taught many Americans that the world was not 6,000 years old, but billions of years old, and that in looking at a wild scene like these Andean mountains, that one saw the slow work of millions and billions of years of geological change. In the context of this time, an individual life didn't seem to matter much. And Church seems to indicate that by giving us one small human figure, an Andean boy with his llama, that marks both the presence of the native peoples, but also the relative unimportance in the scale of history of an individual human life. But while Church was open to the fruits of geological science, he was also a believing Christian who felt that although life, individual human life, might not seem to mean much, the vicissitudes of time and history were still informed by the presence of God. And if you look at that blood-red sun in the distance on the right and follow its reflections on that lake, you see that the reflection goes both to the left and the right and forward from the background to the foreground, creating a cross seeming to suggest that although life may not seem to mean much given the millions of years and billions of years of geological time, 
Nonetheless, the artist wants us to recognize his faith that a divine purpose informs both human history and geological time. This is also by Frederick Church. It's called Syria by the Sea. He painted it a few years after he took a trip to what was then Syria, visiting Beirut, Damascus, Jerusalem, Athens, Rome. In many ways, the painting is thematically similar to Cotopaxi, but where Cotopaxi looks for the signs of God's presence in forming the apparently inhumane cycles of geological time, here Church, like his teacher Cole, focuses on the vicissitudes of human history, giving us ruins of the Roman past and those great pillars, of the Ottoman past in the building on the right, of a crusader castle. In one painting, bringing together scenes from three very different places, he's suggesting that civilizations rise and fall. They rise to fall, but nonetheless, the grandeur of the divine shining through that characteristic church sunset tells us that although life is painful, although we are born to die, although civilizations come to their heights in order to decay and decline, yet there is some divine purpose to all this change. Frederick Church was the most popular best paid artist active in New York in the 1860s. But beginning around 1860, another group of artists began to produce generally smaller, less melodramatic, more intimate paintings that were intended to be seen not on exhibition walls or in the largest private galleries, but in the homes of sensitive collectors who valued more intimate scenes of nature. John Frederick Kensett works changes in this direction, although unfortunately we don't have a great painting by Kensett from this period in his career. But we do have this wonderful painting by Sanford Gifford, who with Kensett was the most important artist to work in this more intimate tradition. Painted in 1872, shortly after he took a trip to Egypt. This is a painting called On the Nile. Shows a felucca temporarily at anchor next to a small Egyptian village. What most excites Gifford about the scene is the sail at the center of the canvas and the reflection of the sail in the Nile in the center foreground. The sail and its reflection seem to operate as something like a staple, linking the sky with the material world of the earth. This painting has always reminded me of a wonderful scene in Thoreau's memoir, Walden, where he too describes a moment where he sees the sky reflected in water and interprets it as a symbol for the imminence of spiritual values within the natural world. Meaning is here, Thoreau says. We don't need to look for it in the hereafter. And Gifford too, inspired as he was by Thoreau and Emerson and the other mid-19th century American transcendentalists, seems to recognize that the miraculous is not something apart and above this world, but a characteristic of this world. I want to end our discussion of landscape painting with this wonderful painting by George Innes. Innes had an incredibly long career producing in the 1840s works that looked a lot like coal, producing in the 1860s works that looked like French Barbizon paintings, and then very much coming into his own in the late 1880s and the early 1890s as an old man. It's a painting which we know Innes' title for, The Lonely Pine, focuses on that tree. By calling it The Lonely Pine, Innes anthropomorphizes it asks us to think about it as an individual. Why would this individual be lonely? Well, what time of day is it? It's dusk, I think. Those black shapes that are hard to read eventually resolve themselves into birds. They seem to have just taken off from that bare patch of water to their left. Time of day, day is dying. Birds are flying south. The artist himself is an elderly man who would die two years later. The painting is about the artist facing death, finding beauty in this world, 
lonely in the face of death, but nonetheless taking joy in the beauties of this world. And I think like the Gifford painting we talked about a minute ago, look at the way that sunburst sky is reflected in the open water at the bottom left. Like Gifford, Innes seems to find the miraculousness in the everyday. The heavens exist in this world too. Meaning is to be found here, not in an old-fashioned belief in a personal afterlife. So we're now leaving the Hudson River Landscape Gallery and coming into this unusual space in which we've installed three of the biggest works in the American Gallery. First, you're looking at the great Lafarge stained glass window that came out of the Unitarian Church on Woodward Avenue in Detroit. One of Lafarge's greatest stained glass windows, one of the greatest stained glass windows produced in the United States in the 19th century. And then Rembrandt Peale's enormous Court of Death, an early 19th century blockbuster describing despair and death, the tragedies of daily life, an exhibition painting which toured throughout the United States for over 60 years. And then last but certainly not least, Washington Alston's most ambitious painting, a painting which has entered American art historical folklore, a painting that he began in England that he thought would build his reputation as one of the great history painters of the 19th century, and a painting which he was never able to complete. Based on the book of Daniel, this is Daniel's preaching to Belshazzar. It was at the time that Alston painted this in the early 19th century, history painting was thought to be the most prestigious and the most important of the genres. Like the paintings by, by Benjamin West that we saw earlier, this is Alston's most ambitious effort at painting a grand history painting. He began it in London, rolled it when he returned to Boston, when he got to Boston, he couldn't find a studio large enough to unroll it, and it was left rolled in his studio for a decade. When he finally unrolled it, he found himself unable to complete the painting, and he spent the last decade of his life saying that he was going to finish it, working on it, rubbing it out, starting over. You can see how much more detailed and full and oily the presentation of Daniel is. Nebuchadnezzar seems pale. He's not finished. He's been painted. But the artist was unhappy with what he did, and he scrubbed it down, intending to repaint it, and never got to. The incompleteness of the painting is especially visible in the far right, where you can see the man with the red headdress has two heads, because Austin was not quite sure where to leave him, and was in the process of relocating the figure. And when he died, he had chalk outlines around the man's body, suggesting where he might draw the figure. And after his death, a studio assistant painted in the chalk lines so we would know the artist's last thought. The painting is itself a ruin and was read that way by Austin's friends, a ruin of the artist's hopes, of his ambitions, a trace of his aspirations, which all came in the end to naught. Rembrandt Peale's The Court of Death is one of the most famous paintings in the museum. Painted in the early 19th century, it was the equivalent of a blockbuster. Intended to be shown to big crowds and special places, Peale and his assistants would charge a nickel or a dime or a quarter for admission. They would pass out pamphlets explaining the story, and the painting would then be shown until everyone in town who wanted to see it would see it, and then it would be rolled up sent to another city. It was on tour in the United States for decades until it ended up in Detroit in the 1880s when a local businessman bought it and gave it to the brand new museum. Indeed, it was one of the first objects to enter the museum's collection. The narrative itself is easy enough to see. We're in a cave. The natural world appears in the upper left-hand corner. The cave is the court of death who's sitting in the center of the canvas. Death comes in many ways, by despair, by alcohol abuse, by disease, by war, by pestilence, by famine. Off to the right, a diseased woman with the torch leads deeper into the gloom of the underworld. The 
Last four galleries all focus on themes in American art from 1870 to 1900. They're not organized exactly chronologically because the art world was becoming so complex. American society was becoming so much larger and so much wealthier that you had different artists working in different traditions on different kinds of materials. The work in this gallery all comes out of what we call the aesthetic movement, inspired by the work of James McNeil Whistler, an American-born artist, but one who made his career in Europe, primarily in London, where he worked closely with the English-born aesthetic movement artists. The aesthetic movement insisted that people should leave, aspire to leading lives of culture and of refinement, surround themselves with beautiful things, not just beautiful paintings, but beautiful cabinets, beautiful silver, beautiful ceramics, beautiful flowers, beautiful clothes. Clothes like are worn by those aesthetic people in the John White Alexander painting the music room who are reclining in beautiful dress, doing something arty, showing off to themselves, but to us too, that these are people of refinement who pursue the finer things in life, who know how to appreciate fine food, fine clothes, fine music, fine furniture, and fine art. In the search for beauty, adherents of the aesthetic movement did not limit themselves to European ideas but ransacked the world, finding Native American, Chinese, Japanese, Islamic, classical motifs and models which they drew on in their efforts to create beautiful things and to live surrounded by beautiful things. Japan was especially influential on the artists and furniture makers, artisans of the aesthetic movement. As Japan was being opened up in the 1860s and 70s, you see in a case like this an impact of black lacquer Japanese furniture which was shown in Philadelphia in the 1876 World's Fair and immediately thereafter furniture makers like Herder Brothers who made this cabinet began to produce their own Japanese lacquer inspired black ebony furnishings which incorporated both classical motifs as you see on the center door but also Japanese motifs like these leaf patterns that decorate the styles. The first American artist to be deeply influenced by the British aesthetic movement was James McNeil Whistler. Born in the United States, Whistler left the United States at age 21 to go to Europe and study in France, and then after completing his studies in Paris, moved to London, spending most of the 1860s and 70s and 80s in London. DIA has four wonderful paintings by Whistler, including this wonderful portrait of a newspaper man who he met in London, but who earlier in his career had worked in Detroit, and this wonderful seascape which Whistler painted in 1893. I find the seascape especially moving in its abstractness. From a distance, it might almost look like a small Rothko with that focus on the deep greens of rolling waves in a roiled ocean with one with a distant view of a big sky and some lilac clouds. And if you look closely, just one or two soft triangles linking the foreground sea with the distant sky of a sailboat on the far horizon. Whistler painted this small study while in a rowboat out at sea while he and his wife were staying on the Isle of Brahat off the Normandy coast in France. He fell in love with the view and painted two somewhat larger views of the same scene in canvas, which are now both in American museums. This is the smallest of the three paintings that Whistler painted off the Isle of Brahat, but I think it's the greatest of them. You can feel the immediacy. You can imagine Whistler sitting in his small boat with his oil sketch box on his knees waiting for the ocean, for that moment of stillness between when the waves rise and fall to add just the brushstroke which he knew he wanted to add. There are three paintings behind me. The two on the outside were painted by Dwight Tryon. The one in the middle was painted by Thomas Dewing. Dewing and Tryon were friends and in fact all three of these paintings were commissioned 
by one person, Frank Hecker of Detroit, to decorate the end wall in the music room of his mansion at the corner of Ferry Street and Woodward Avenue in Detroit. The three form a sequence of the seasons, with spring on the left, summer in the middle, fall on the right. Dwight Tryon and Thomas Dewing both met Whistler, knew Whistler's work, and were influenced by Whistler. Although they're a generation younger, they reflect the maturation or the belated impact of the aesthetic movement on American art. The aesthetic movement began in England in the 1850s and 60s. American artists began to respond to it in the 1870s and 80s. These works all date from 1893, about the same time as the Whistler seascape that we looked at a few minutes ago. I think of these three, you'll notice that the Tryons have no figures in them. We look, but the scene is a misty, evanescent scene of a commonplace field, probably based on fields that he saw near his summer home in Massachusetts. No people, I think no people because he wants us to get lost in the environment as if we were there. The time of day is unclear, but it's all very quiet. It implies that the observer is sensitive to the smallest nuance of nature and able to take joy in it. A motif which seems to be much more explicitly developed in the central painting by Thomas Dewing. Unlike the two paintings by Tryon, which frame the Dewing and which have no figures in them, the Dewing centers on two women dressed in vaguely old-fashioned clothes, evoking a colonial past, out in a field. Time of day is either early morning or perhaps late at night. We can tell that because there's a low moon rising or setting behind the distant hill. The women are out in a field. I tend to think it's early morning, and I want to believe that they've been out all night singing, dancing, talking with friends. They walk through the fields. Maybe the dew is starting to settle. They don't have solid legs. It's almost as if they're floating through these fields, as if their refinement is so elegant that they're not quite of this world, but rather float above it in their ecstasy at aesthetic experience. Floating above it, sort of like those blue blossoming flowers that you see in the meadow at their feet that don't have any stems, that aren't really coming out of nature, but seem like the women almost to float above the world, symbolizing, again, the imminence of meaning within nature, the miraculousness of the everyday, if only we have the eyes of perception with which to see it. One of the great pieces of silver in this room is this strawberry server with spoon by the Whiting Company of New York, made around 1875. What I find especially moving, besides its color and the delicacy of all the construction, is that fairy, like something out of Midsummer Night's Dream, asleep inside a flower with a butterfly about to land next to her suggesting again the miraculousness of the everyday. Fairies at this point in time do stand for that, the fact that the world around us is miraculous if we only have the eyes to see it. And indeed, the fairy in her flower home with the butterfly reminds me of those two women in the doing painting floating up above the ground as the moon rises behind them. We looked at a number of paintings from the 1860s. Code epoxy was painted in the 1860s. I'm not sure Church realized it, but the American Civil War transformed everything. In this gallery, we have four paintings by Winslow Homer, one of the best known American artists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Homer's earliest work dates from the Civil War, including this painting, Defiance, inviting a shot before Petersburg which he painted in 1864. At the right, a rebel soldier stands on a bulwark, heroically or foolishly, maybe both, daring 
the Yankee sharpshooters to his left to do their best to shoot him. At the far left, we see a puff of smoke. The shot is already on the way. Will it strike home? Girl with Laurel was painted by Winslow Homer 15 years later, after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, after the transformation of American society had proceeded apace. And it seems to reflect a certain exhaustion characteristic of American society in the 1870s and early 1880s. So much had changed so fast. So much had changed so fast that many Americans were exhausted by the pace of change and began to feel nostalgic for the verities of rural life or of an older way of being in the world or life on the farm that they once had or that their parents had or that they imagined their grandparents had. Forgetting the difficulties of life on the farm and just remembering the supposed simplicity of it. Here in this painting painted in upstate New York, Homer has bought an old-fashioned costume and has asked his model to dress up as if she was a maid in a dairy in an English farm in the 18th century trying to get back past even before the beginning of the American rural life that he remembered. This 18-inch sculpture of William Penn is a model for the gigantic figure of William Penn that stands on top of the Philadelphia City Hall. It was modeled by Alexander Milne Calder, the father of the 20th century modernist Alexander Calder. What I love about it is the way it reflects the late 19th century search for a older way of being in the world. It's very much a piece of the colonial revival that sprouted in the United States after the 1870s. 1876 it was, of course, the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. There was a World's Fair in Philadelphia for which the New England and Middle Atlantic states sent state exhibitions that focused on their colonial past. And as America rushed headlong into the future, spreading railroads across the continent, building bigger and newer factories, cities filling with immigrants, older Americans, challenged Americans, Americans frightened by the pace of change, looked both to beauty, wherever they could find it, as in the aesthetic movement, or looked to the colonial past, or looked to rural life, to find some stability in a world that was changing oh so rapidly. When I was in graduate school studying art history, I used to sometimes go to a bar, which over the bar had written out the letters I, Y, A, M, W, T, M, Y, H, T, B, M, A, D. And if anyone new to the bar was foolish enough to ask what it meant, he or she was told, if you ask me what that means, you have to buy me a drink. So it was a bar game. This painting, too, was a kind of bar game. It was designed to fool the eye, illustrated, installed at the end of a room and well lit. It might seem to someone like it was an old New England farmhouse, maybe from Connecticut, in fact. In fact, the person who commissioned it had a carpenter put together a version of the hearth that he remembered from his grandmother's rural Connecticut home and hired John Haberly to paint the scene as they both imagined it might have been a hundred years before. The coonskin cap, the weathered farmer's hat, the tin candle lantern, the peppers drying over the roaring hearth, Indeed, the painting reaches out of the past into our present so that you can see the ash pan hangs over the frame. The shovel hangs into our world. The past won't stay past, but reaches into our world. Intriguingly enough, this painting has been in Detroit since the 1880s for spending much of the late 19th and early 20th century in a restaurant known as Churchill's in downtown Detroit. This giant cabinet, and it is very big, it makes me feel small. In fact, I think it was intended to make people standing next to it feel small. 
This cabinet was made by a New York company named Potty and Stymus. It was the center of their booth at the 1876 World's Fair in Philadelphia. What's unique about it is because it was shown at the fair, we have a reproduction of it as it was shown at the fair and so that we know that this was indeed a unique item and that this is the exact cabinet that was shown at the fair. The style of furniture was known as Renaissance Revival. Potty and Stymus said that this piece was based on the style of furniture associated with King Henry II of France. It reflected the tastes of the new multimillionaires, the people like the Rockefellers or the Huntingtons who built the railroads, who mined the coal, who created the steel, who produced the petroleum that fueled American economic and industrial expansion. The piece was grandiose because it was designed to go into grandiose homes where the space and the furnishings were designed to show off the great wealth and achievements of the new American ruling classes. From the early 19th century until after the Civil War, American artists and art patrons demanded that art somehow be distinctively American, show something authentic about the distinctive American culture. Things changed after the Civil War with the increasing wealth and cosmopolitanism of American society. And both the buyers and the appreciators of art began to think of art as timeless. Yes, Art by an American would be somehow American, but it also ought to be informed by the craft skills that could only be learned in Europe, which still offered the finest in artistic training, and ought to explore timeless values. After of the generation of artists who come to the fore in the 1870s and 80s, almost all of them spent formative years studying in Europe. Some like Thomas Aiken studying in France, some like William Merritt Chase studying in Germany. This great portrait by Aiken of Dr. Horatio C. Wood, an influential Philadelphian psychiatrist, is one of a series of paintings, portraits that Aiken's painted showing in grand scale academics, sportsmen, people who we don't traditionally think of as heroes, but who Aikens paints as the heroes of modern life. Heroes who've taken control of their bodies to transform themselves into amateur but skilled sportsmen, or intellectuals like Wood, who was a prominent Philadelphia psychiatrist, here shown at his desk, interrupted in a moment of thought producing new knowledge. Aiken's point in paintings like this is heroism in the modern world, in the contemporary world of the 1880s and the 1890s, is not something won on the battlefield, but is something won on the sports fields of America's elite universities, or in the private offices of thinkers and academics and teachers. Where Thomas Aiken studied in Paris, William Merritt Chase, studied in Munich. The DIA has a great collection of works by Chase, including these four and two paintings shown in other galleries. Painting on the left is a, one of his young daughters. What I love about it is how totally abstract the painting behind her and to her right is. Dorothy is dressed in her little brown riding hood as if she's just come in or is just going to go out. But I love how painterly that moment in the background is. Totally abstract. Chase's love of the media itself. You can see something similarly fleshy and oily in the wonderful painting of a fish market in Venice that we have up high. Interestingly, when this was first painted, there was a Venetian fisherman in the top right corner of the painting reaching into the fish basket to reach out a fresh caught fish to offer the viewer or the buyer. Chase sold the painting, 15 years later bought it back and decided that he didn't want to tell the story. He wanted to just focus our attention on the 
fresh, glistening surfaces and textures of the skate and the shark and the squid and the shrimp and the red fish and the colors, the smells. You can almost smell the salt. I can almost smell the salt when I look at this painting. It reminds me of a wonderful Rembrandt of a slaughtered side of beef in the City Museum in Glasgow, Scotland. Like Aikens and William Merritt Chase, the sculptor Augusta St. Gordon's was one of the many post-Civil War American artists who went to Europe to study. In his case, to study sculpture. St. Gordon's is the greatest Beaux-Arts sculpture of the United States. This is based on the large sculpture of the Standing Lincoln, which was commissioned by the city of Chicago and installed in Lincoln Park. It is still there today. Lincoln has just pushed himself up from his chair, is deep in thought, his head bowed. The chair behind him is Roman, embellished with the great eagle of the United States government, inscribed pluribus, evoking the great seal of the United States out of one many, out of many one. Lincoln here stands for the unifier of the nation. He who heroically kept the nation whole associated with the classical verities of politics, of great men. He nonetheless is dressed in modern robe, suggesting that heroism is still alive today, that one can still do heroic deeds as Lincoln, the martyred president, had done. Aikens went to Paris and studied with French realist painters. Chase went to Munich and worked with Munich artists who also worked in a realist idiom, but a German one. Artists like Child Hassam, Willard Metcalf, Theodore Robinson went to Paris, but instead of studying with older painters like Lair, they found their way to Monet, to Degas, to the younger artists who we come to think of as Impressionists. Indeed, Theodore Robinson moved to Giverny, and both of our paintings by Robinson are painted at Giverny, where Robinson became close friends with Monet, in fact attended the wedding of one of the American artists who married Monet's daughter. In this late afternoon painting done in the fall, we see the purpley shadows characteristic of Monet's work creeping out to the foreground, pointing our eyes towards that brilliantly lit haystack. Indeed, it is the same haystack that we see in the great Monet paintings. Like Theodore Robinson, William Metcalf was a New Englander who went to France to study, met the Impressionists, was influenced by their work, and returned home to paint beautiful Impressionist paintings like this winter scene in New Hampshire. He called it the White Veil as the softly falling snow silently piling up veils the specifics of the everyday New Hampshire environment, turning it into a beautiful winter wonderland. Like Robinson and Metcalf, Child Hassam is one of the New England artists who went to Europe, was influenced by contemporary French Impressionism. This painting was painted in Havana, Cuba, the day before Cuba established independence from Spain. Looking out of his hotel room over the hot, dusty square, we can feel the heat rise. The contrast with Metcalf's white veil is striking. The one cold New England winter, this hot Havana summer, the sun almost at its peak. Notice there's almost no shadows. The people in the market square huddle under the trees looking for what shade they can. A slow wind rustles through the trees, offering a cooling breeze. The flag 
in the distance over the fort, flaps in the salving sea breeze. We can smell the salt, smell the dryness, feel the breeze, feel Hassam's excitement in the sensory overload of this Caribbean hot day. Another American painter who went to Paris and met the Impressionists was Mary Cassatt. About a decade older than most of the other American Impressionists, Mary Cassatt got to Paris just as the Impressionists were beginning to show their own work and became especially close with Degas. In fact, of all the Americans, she was the only one to show in any of the Impressionist exhibitions. She and Degas became close friends, often working together. We can sometimes see them painting the same scene from different vantage points. This painting, painted when she was 36, is a portrait of her brother, Alexander J. Cassatt, who was president of the Pennsylvania Railroad and an important American manufacturer, businessman. It's one of the few paintings by Cassatt that Cassatt ever painted of a man. Best known for her paintings of women and children, most of Cassatt's paintings are in fact of family members. They have an intimacy unlike that of any of the other French Impressionists, unlike that of any of the other American Impressionists. For me, what's wonderful about this portrait of her brother is its intimacy and its abstractness. Notice the right part of the canvas is left unfinished. His hands are indicated, but there's a study in colors and textures. We see him deep in thought, like the Aikens, portrait of the psychiatrist. But here we see a businessman apparently reading some sort of business paper, lost in thought, but surrounded by color, by texture, by volume. It's one of my favorite paintings in the gallery. What better place to end our tour of the American wing than with these three great paintings by John Singer Sargent. Born in the United States to American parents, Sargent was raised in Europe, a gifted musician, as well as a gifted painter, he's only settled on painting as his métier in his adolescence and quickly became one of the most influential and successful professional portrait painters in Europe. Looking at this great portrait of Mrs. Poisson, Madame Paul Poisson, one can see why he was a success. The young woman looks out directly from the canvas to us, holding her dress elegantly, arms folded, poised, self-assured, a figure of a young, wealthy woman at ease with herself and at ease with her world. In addition to commissions, Sargent also painted for himself. And when he painted for himself, his work often shows the influence of contemporary Impressionist style and technique, as in this wonderful portrait of his sister and his sister's friend, Miss Wedgwood, on vacation. Dressed in black, not because they're in mourning, but because they're stylish afternoon clothes. Underneath those odd contraptions, which they had developed for themselves to keep off the mosquitoes. Reading to each other, apparently unconcerned and unaware of the artist who's rapidly sketching them, the painting suggests the intimacy of the relationship between Sargent, his sister, and her friend, that they could become the models for his work so easily, so readily, accepting his presence not as an intrusion, but as an everyday fact of their common lives together. The blacks pulsate against those rich ruby reds, creating a shocking image of wealth. Not wealth financially, but a wealth of opportunity, a richness of the lived life. Reading books, writing letters, the sun illuminating the walls of the covered passageway that they're sitting in. One feels the richness of the lives these three friends are living. The first painting by Sargent to enter the DIA collection, Home Fields, was painted in Broadway, England, where Sargent spent some of his summers. Broadly painted, again, 
It shows the impact of Impressionism on the works that Sargent painted largely for himself. And indeed, if you look closely in the shadow to the right of the tree on the left, you can see the vague outline of a kneeling figure, the painter in shadow, hard at work on the sketch from which this painting was based. Well, this closes my tour of the American wing. But before I let you go, I wanted to share with you these two great paintings by James Whistler, which are shown not in the American wing, but in galleries in the North Wing, where we combine European and American works of art. This gallery, as I look around, I see works by Renoir, by Van Gogh, by Cezanne, by Degas, many of Whistler's contemporaries. Indeed, only about two-thirds of the American collection is in the American wing. The rest, including some wonderful paintings from the late 19th century, and all our American works from after 1900, are displayed in the North Wing, where they're shown in mixed galleries, including both European and American works of art. I'd love to show you those, but for touring the mixed European-American galleries, you'll have to tune in another time, another day. A visit to the Detroit Institute of Arts is a wonderful experience. The American art galleries show how Americans appreciated art through the centuries and how they changed from colonists in the New World to artists and citizens of this New World. The DIA is open Tuesdays through Thursdays, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., Fridays, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., Saturdays and Sundays, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. For more information, call 313-833-7900 or visit www.dia.org. Admission to the museum is free for Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County residents. Come and visit one of America's great museums.